my territory.
praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Good evening, good evening, good evening. On behalf of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Aaron L. Parker, the Still Learning Committee, and the Zion Hill Baptist Church at large, welcome you to our first installment of our Faith and Social Justice uh, event series. Praise God for your uh, for your presence here on today. We are grateful indeed to uh, be in this assembly, and we want to move expeditiously. Before we go any further throughout the, uh, the service tonight, our experience tonight, I want to give a couple of preliminary instructions to you. Everyone that walked in today, you received a color-coded number. If you have not received a color-coded number, uh, please raise your hand if you did not receive a color-coded number, and we will get that to you as quickly as we can. Let us explain what that means. After our dynamic speaker, Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, finishes unpacking her uh, topic, you're going to be pushed out into breakout rooms for the purpose of gathering uh, some salient questions to bring back to Dr. Fry Brown when we reconvene. I'm going to ask our facilitators to stand so you can know who they are. So immediately, immediately when Dr. Fry Brown gets done, you're going to rush to your breakout areas. I'm going to ask Elder Fishburne to stand, Dr. Pearl Smith, Reverend Kevin Jackson, and Dr. Matthew Platt. Elder Fishburne, if you have color code card one, Elder Fishburne, you're going to be stationed here in the sanctuary. If you have uh, card two, Dr. Matthew Platt, he will take you to the chapel. If you have color card code number three, Dr. Pearl Smith, you'll be on the left-hand side of the fellowship hall. And if you have card four, uh, Reverend Kevin Jackson will share with you in the fellowship hall on the right-hand side. Those are your preliminary instructions for you. And at this time, we're going to ask if uh, Deacon Nichelle Williams will come and open, up, open us up with prayer. And then after that, we're going to have a song by Brother Henry Goodgame. And then we have the introduction of our speaker by Deacon Cheryl Hendricks. Let us go to the throne of grace. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we come to thank you and praise you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity for everyone. Lord, we pray that you would still get those who get the needs. Lord, help us to do better at what we do. Lord, we talk about separation of church and state. In you, there is nothing. So, Lord, we must do what is right. And Lord, we thank you for giving us the heart and the mind and the desire to serve you. Lord, we ask that you would be with our speakers. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of them sharing their knowledge. Lord, be with the breakout rooms. So Lord, that what is said in there will be taken to heart and we will be, it will be used to serve you better. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for our church. We thank you for the celebration, Lord, of this wonderful time. Yes, we're still learning, and we're still going to play. And, Lord, because of that, we can glorify you even more in all that we say, do, and think. Now, be with us, Lord. Bless us. Keep us. Provide for us. Protect us from all hurt, harm, danger, and disease, especially this virus and every variant there is. Protect us, Lord. We love you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we do pray in such great faith. Amen, amen, and amen.
Let a rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Only the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have that a weary feet come to the place for with our Father's side, We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading a path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from a gloomy past till now we stand at last till we find with feet of our bright star his cast God of all weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by Thy the places our God where we met thee, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee, shadow beneath thy hand. God, true to our name, land, our native land.
family and friends. It's good to see everyone here tonight. My uh, charge is to introduce our illustrious speaker. I hope I do her justice. Dr. Reverend, uh, Reverend Teresa Fry Brown is a native of Independence, Missouri. She is a 14th historiographer of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She serves as the editor of the AME Review, the di executive director of research and scholarship, as well as the president of the General Officers Council for the AME Church. She is the Bandy Professor of Preaching and an Associate Academic Dean at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. She is the first tenured black female at the Candler School of Theology. She is the third black female full professor at Emory University. What accomplishments. What accomplishments. Dr. Fry Brown has extensive teaching and preaching experience in national, international, academic, and ecumenical settings. She has numerous books. She has written and authored numerous books, articles, and essays. Dr. Fry Brown is a member of the American Academy of Religion, the Society for the Study of Black Religion, and the Academy of Homiletics. Dr. Fry Brown's life is governed by the words of the prophet Isaiah. Those whose hope is in the Lord will gain new strength. She's guided by the words of, the, of Mohandas Gandhi. We must be the change we want to see in the world. And what a prophetic topic for this evening. So without further ado, Dr. <laughs> Praise God for this opportunity. I want to thank my brother, the Reverend Dr. Aaron Parker, for calling on me again. I've known him ever since I've been here in Atlanta. So I guess Atlanta is supposed to be my home now. It's been 27 years, so I guess I should claim it. And to Sister Sheila Smith Parker and all the leadership here. I always over prepare. And so I'm going to try to cut down some things and refer you to some things and we'll get to some other information. And Dr. Parker told me to be careful when I'm moving this so everything sinks. So I want to talk about faith and social justice. That it's more than political correctness. I don't care which um, news media you follow, there's always going to be some discussion about that's not biblical. That's not what it's supposed to be. And everybody knows the truth depends on what your truth looks like as to what you do. And so what I'd like to do today is to explore some of the biblical imperatives and faith imperatives around this thing we call justice. Look at biblical justice particularly, because sometimes I think we begin to think that social justice is a protest, it is a t-shirt, it is a hashtag, it is fighting each other in the street, and it has nothing to do with humanity. We spend more time dragging people than we do building people up. And because human suffering does not have an ethnicity or a race or a gender, we are supposed to love the people enough to want them to live. That is the basis of any kind of justice. So hopefully we can navigate this to a point. Um, let me start here. This particular saying that the true church stays on the edge of life where the real moans and groans are. Most church folks settle to be comfortable and build doctrinal walls to protect themselves for anyone that thinks or looks differently than they do. We see that when somebody protests something and somebody's yelling against it. And I'm sure that sometimes in my own mind, uh, Dr. Vincent Harding, who wrote many of Dr. King's speeches and helped start the King Center, would always say to me, we have to have individual transformation before we can have societal transformation. 
And what you do is you start thinking differently about something and then you talk to someone else, don't scream at someone else, but talk to someone else who may believe a little bit differently than you, but it's okay. And by the time I get to this half hour, you'll know that it's more than, social justice is more than race and gender and sexuality. For whatever reason, we seem to just think that's what justice is, race, gender, and sexuality. And then we go off into our little, you know, we sit and text each other when we're talking about it or we go to have lunch after church and we're doing more injustice than we're doing justice. Um, okay. We understand that most of us already know this Lukean passage about what we're supposed to do when we are, the Spirit of the Lord is on us, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But this piece about bringing good news to the poor, that means poor in spirit, physically poor, economically poor, all those kinds of things. Proclaim the release of the prisoners is more than a, than a prison ministry. It's halfway house. It's also how we treat people when they show up at church after they've been transitioned out of prison. We're real good when people are locked up, but what do we do when they show up? We have to kind of think that thing through, right? And recovery of the sight to the blind. I've been in ministry now for 40 years, and sometimes the people with vision problems are sitting inside the church. And so the recovery of the sight of the blind is not always outside of the church. Sometimes we do wonderful ministry, we call it social justice ministry, but we haven't done in reach. And I know that doesn't happen here, but let's think about what that is. And so I wanted to, uh, I'm not going to play that, thank you. Oh, we can't go this way. All right, it's there. There's a little clip, oh, okay. There was a little clip, I know many of you saw the movie Harriet. Uh, if we're going to go to the clip, this clip for me is what it's like to begin to do social justice. If we can go back to that, that would be wonderful. If not, I can press forward. All right, just for a minute. Oh, I have to push it again? We love technology. We can't go this way. There's danger. God say which way we can go? Left. Swim. Me neither. Robert, care the baby. Isaac, help Miss Lucy. Uh, Junior, help Jane. This fool trying to drown us. Lindsay, you done gone fool crazy. We got an old woman and a baby with us. Oh, we ain't going in that river. Come on, y'all. I say we are. Now you be free or die. I ain't leave my wife and my family to drown like no rat. You wanna shoot me? Mm. Go ahead. Did she drown? Who gonna lead us? She the only one know the way to freedom land. I want to see freedom land before I die. I'll lead you to the bridge, follow me. Come on now, come on. Come on. Come on. Look at that. 
I want us to think about this. Some people chose not to go forward in social justice because you have an idea and you want to go forward. We cannot damn the people who stay behind. There are enough things to work on that maybe that's what God told them to work on. And maybe God's going to tell you to work on something else. But too often, I know we're just, we have justice fatigue. I write a lot about justice fatigue when every morning there's something else and there's something else and there's something else. And you cannot do justice 24 seven or you will die. Sometimes you have to take a sabbatical. If Jesus took a sabbatical, so can you. But you have somebody else. Maybe today's the day that Dr. Parker is working on something. And tomorrow's the day that I'm walking on something and walking out on faith and doing it. But we spend so much time telling people, you ought to do this, that nothing gets done at all. And if, when I go through these topics, maybe my topic is about, I have a, a four-month-old grandson. Maybe I want to work on children's rights now. But last year, I was working on students' rights. There are so many areas of justice to work in. We have to stop fighting each other, saying, you're not showing up for this, because we start spinning our wheels and we look like a gerbil. It's like the people that go on, on, you know, on, on uh, Facebook and say, if you don't preach about this this Sunday, you don't love your people. You don't know who those people are preaching with. You don't know what they've studied in Bible study. There could be people that have been doing different types of justice moves 24-7, and we need to leave them alone. Work on what you can work on. Harriet could walk out into the water, and the other people, maybe they, were, they stayed behind for a reason. One of them said, we have a baby. He could be working on something completely different. So just keep that in mind. So we're going to start with biblical justice, because that's what I was called to talk about, right? So the first one is attributive justice. This means that each person is treated as an individual. We do too much stereotyping. All black people are not alike. All white people are not alike. All Baptists are not alike. All Methodists are not alike. Each one is treated as an individual with individual gifts according to his or her, her own dignity. That's attributive justice. Distributive justice is the rules of fair play. In the Old Testament, we are told to protect the poor. We are told that. So we don't need to put up pictures when we feed people. Everything is not a photo op. That way you're not doing social justice, you're doing self-promotion. Hmm. We got it? Okay, 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 okay. I'm not preaching this time, but I'm almost getting there. And, and so the rules of fair play and according to people's needs. And the basis is to ask people what they need. Don't tell them what they need. Sit with people and listen to them and let them tell you what they need instead of showing up saying, you need this, this, or this, or this. Okay? That's uh, then retributive justice is making right of wrong relationships. Making right of wrong relationships. It's about punishment, but it's also about restoration. Some of us are really good at dragging people and tearing them down, but we don't go to restoration. So we haven't done justice. It's like reconciliation is not I'm sorry. Reconciliation means that you ask for forgiveness, but forgiveness has to be, be given by the one that you harmed. And sometimes we say I'm sorry just to get people to shut up. That's not justice. That's again taking care of one's own needs. Okay? Injustice is any act of violence. It does not have to be shooting someone because of their race. Someplace in James it says your tongue is a mighty member. And sometimes Christians do more death dealing with their tongues than they do if they had an AK-47, to be perfectly honest with you. So we have to keep that in mind if we're going to talk about justice. And when we're talking about justice, and when we're standing around saying what we should do, we cannot call names. Because then that's just injustice on top of the justice that we're talking about. All right? And when we're doing justice, we can't always be paid for it. Okay? And we have to learn that in the biblical text, all kinds of people were working, so we can't keep going to the same list of people to get us out of our, our problems. 
everyone in this room if we understand attributive justice, distributive justice, retributive justice, and injustice can be a faithful worker of social justice. Individual justice first. So the first step that we have to do is look at our own selves and see what we've been helping happen. Right? We have to do it. We have to examine ourselves. You know, the Bible says examine yourself to see who we have harmed, what we have been silent about, what we jump on because it looks like we'll be popular. So the first step is to examine oneself. The second step, it may take me a little bit to get here. I, was, I, I will do this when we come back. I'll, I'll leave a list of these. Most of the time we go to Amos, or we go to Micah, you know, what does the Lord require of me that we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord? In the, in the Old Testament, it says you shouldn't be having poor people around you. It says don't clean up everything on the field, let people have something to eat. It talks about washing your own self and making your own self clean and stop sniffing with other people that come next to you. Hmm. It's in the book. I didn't make it up. You, y- y'all can see some of those, right? It's in the book. It's in the book. Deuteronomy, from the beginning of the biblical text, in the Psalms, in the wisdom literature, all the way through the New Testament, it's about relationality. Social justice is about relationality. When it says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, the second is to it, you love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes there's injustice because we don't love ourselves. And when we hate ourselves, then we mistreat our neighbor. And if you go to 1 John, it says, how can you say you love me when you don't even see me? But you see your brothers and sisters every day. You know that little little nipping that we do when people come into church? You know when y'all used to come regularly, you know what I'm saying? When people come into church, that's injustice. So we can't talk about love of neighbor when we are doing hatred of neighbor before and while we're in a sanctuary. Hmm. Okay. Just saying, just saying. Um... Okay. Let me talk about one of the barriers to social justice, and I'm going to get into two different areas that we can talk about social justice. You see where it says channels? Some of us get our fodder for injustice from media. And I'm not just talking about social media. Uh, when I was growing up, my grandmother used to sit on the front porch, and she was like the town crier. And she, yeah, y'all didn't have grandparents that did that, you know. And she knew everybody's business and could pass it on when different people came up the street. Well, that's what we do. And we don't research what we are talking about. And so sometimes we make situations worse because we run with the first thing that we hear instead of seeing if it is in fact true. And once somebody starts talking about something with wrong facts, then it becomes legend and it's hard to erase it. So think about your community networks, think about the people that you talk with day after day, and then we're going to talk about how we can, uh, this piece right here. We run into difficulty with justice because sometimes we deny that something has happened. And trust me, it is easy to say it's because of race, but there's something called interlocking pieces of injustice. Nothing is ever just race or just gender or just this or just that. Everything is about relationship and power. It's all about power. We talk about a God who's all powerful, but the basis of our injustice socially is based on power. I'm not talking about buying votes. I'm talking about thinking of oneself more highly than one ought to. That's in the text someplace. It's in the book. It's in a real good book. Y'all should try that sometime. And, and so we have to think of that. So sometimes we even deny something's happened. Sometimes instead of even talking with each other about a problem, our defenses automatically come up. Because we were wounded in 1908, we believe we're going to be wounded in 2022. And so we stop talking with people and we talk at people. Right? It talks about two walking together and agreeing. And sometimes we walk side by side, but we're going in different directions. And when it talks about for Pentecost, since you just had that, 
all in one place on one accord didn't mean they, they did the same work. They thought about God the same way. So everybody has something. I want you to think about what is your passion about what you think needs to be rectified in the world. And then I want you to think about how much that means to you. And when you go back to your groups, understand that if five other people in the room don't think that's important, let them alone. Because something else is important to them. You work where God puts you. And what God puts you on, and we will rectify some of this stuff. Sometimes we minimize what's going on. Uh, have you been on a job where somebody's called you out of their name and then somebody says, oh, it, it didn't matter? They didn't mean it. I was a speech pathologist in my former life. If you're able to say it, you meant it. All right? Because your brain has to help you formulate an idea before your articulators start moving and you breathe and the sound comes up. So when they say it, they meant it. And when you say it, do not, there's no such thing as a slip of the tongue either. That's a lie. That's a, that's a cover up because you got caught. What you want to say is, I didn't mean for you to hear it. That's what you want to say. Not that I didn't mean to say it, but I didn't mean to hear it, all right? And sometimes things are so bad we begin to adapt to it. That's just the way things always are. Social justice means we use what's called, Burke calls a moral imagination, where we think about things the way that God would want them to be, not the way they are. We can imagine something completely different than the way it has always been. It's when we keep doing that same thing over and over again, we never get anything done. This speaking the truth in power that we use so much, please understand we borrow that from the Quakers. We borrow that from the Quakers uh, as an alternative to violence. It doesn't mean to talk all the time. It means to step back, assess what's going on, and then find what is right for as many people as possible. It's an alternative to violence. I've already talked about verbal violence. So we haven't even started about how we fight each other. I was watching, I think it was in Philadelphia, where two young men were knocked on the street and they had an opportunity to walk away, but they picked up guns and went and shot somebody and one of them died. Speaking truth to power is, what could I do differently? Right, we, 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 we all are on powder kegs right now. And it seems like it's easier to strike out than to, take a breath and consider what else we can do, okay? The other thing about social justice is be, we can't keep doing the same thing the same way. Everything does not demand a march. Everything does not demand you be in the street. Everything does not demand money. Sometimes you need to go someplace and discuss what you're gonna do before you jump out there and put, stop putting your plans on the internet. Now I'm in church, but I think that's the dumbest move I've ever seen. I'm from the 60s, I used to have a lot of hair, so I protested a lot in the 60s at universities. But I've never seen people try to change something by telling somebody all their business. It just doesn't make sense to me. But just don't, this we gonna be there at this time, this what we gonna do which is how people snuck in and caused violence because we told them where we was going to be and what time we were going to do it, what we're going to have on and what we're going to eat afterwards. Hmm. All right, let me go on. <laughs> Part of what happens with faith and social justice is believing that change can take place. I know you're all tired. Some of us have been doing this our entire life, but we still have to have enough faith that God we come in on Sunday, we shout all over the place, and we go out and then we just, I just don't know what we gonna do now. We've been doing this forever, right? And, but we have to have enough faith to know and believe that God gives us what we do to make the change. Believe it. And if the first time we do something, it doesn't work out, then you go back to the drawing board and talk together and do it. And stop making one person in charge. Okay, so when I was growing up, that's when science fiction movies first started, and there was always somebody up that showed up, some alien that showed up and said, take us to your leader. 
So we got in the habit of choosing one person to run the show. So then they killed the one person and we sat around for 15 years wondering what's we gonna do next. Instead of understanding everybody in here is a leader of something in some way, all right? So our language becomes important. Uh, this, I don't know if you can see it real well, I apologize for it, but Warren Stewart says, we have to understand that God is continuously active in the process of our liberation. God did not go to sleep. God did not forget. God did not run away. We probably were so busy planning our next move, we didn't listen to what God told us to do in the some first place. And sometimes God says, sit your behind down and wait on me. So we believe that God knows ahead of time why we run in front of God. Okay? That the Holy Spirit is still working. That God affirms the dignity of every person. This is where I think we've gone off the rails when we talk about social justice. We have made people the arbiters of what is the dignity of every person. When God affirms everyone. It says when God made humanity, God said that's good. And we spend 75% of our time saying what's ugly. We're inventing ways to kill each other. But God is the arbiter of that. God created all right. I did imagination. Oh, all right. To transform or the social justice means to change the way we've done some things. It means to, to look at a situation and believe that uh, we may need some new ways of thinking, some new ways of doing, some new ways of naming. I am just baffled. With, I, I assign my students reality television. I am baffled by the preponderance of rea so-called reality television where we sit and cheer black people cussing and hitting each other. Everything's a competition, but we're supposed to be serving a God that brings people together. I, that, that doesn't fit right in my head. And so then how do we expect other people to treat us if they see how we treat each other? I don't, I'm, that was just a question. I just don't understand it because the market does what the market will bear. So somebody watching it. So I'm not going to ask you if you're watching it. I'm just making a point. I also think it's very interesting that we're talking about gun reform and a movie that's made almost a billion dollars is called Top Gun. That's confusing to me, but sometimes I get confused. I'm 71. I get confused every now and then. I just want you all to know that. Now, if we're going to work on social justice, we have to read and read and read and read and research and research and research and research until we get it right. You know, the first thing out of Uvalde was, this is what happened in the school. Six reports later, they said, no, this is what happens with the school. So sometimes when we're talking about a justice move, we run with the first bit of information, but we don't have enough information. So it has to keep being reevaluated and fact-checked. I said to admit your own complicity in what's going on. Everybody, before we decide on what we're going to be talking about and working on, say, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Okay? Um, I say to my students all the time, when we start talking about privilege, uh, two-thirds of the world can't read. So anybody in this room can read? you already privileged. That's why they name it white privilege. All of us got here on some mode of transportation, even if we walked, privileged. So what is it that Teresa is consuming that's keeping someone else from having? What is it that you are doing that's keeping somebody else out? That's complicity. It doesn't mean you have to do flagellation and beat yourself up, but recognize that you're in a place to do something that somebody else cannot do, all right? Claim your own, name yourself. I said believe others can change. You have to name yourself. They called me lots of names when I first got to Candler School of Theology, including one professor calling me Shaniqua because I had braids. He has since retired, and I'm the academic dean. Won't God do it? Right? <laughs> but because he called me that, I didn't live into it. Right? So you have to name your own self. So you can't just come to church and say you're a child of God. You've got to carry yourself like you belong to somebody 
that people can't treat you any old way. And because if you name yourself, you don't have to cuss people out all the time. Not, not, not all the time. Not, I tell people I, get a, I have a reserve one just in case. But you, because I grew up fighting in Missouri. I grew up fighting in Missouri and people call me the N-word and everything else. So I can fight. But it says the Lord will fight your battles if you just keep still. So I got to ask God to slow me down because I'm ready to go. You know what I'm saying? And so, 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 but you got to learn to name who you are. And it doesn't have to be the same name of the person sitting next to you. My grandmother, who died at 102, called herself colored her entire life and got upset when I called myself black. And I got upset because she was working in somebody's home until my simple behind when I was 45 understood I would not have had clothes for school had she not been working in the home. She called herself a domestic. In my age group, that was, be, that was working for the man. Like I had a window and a pot, you know what I'm saying? And, and so we, we have, um, okay. Y'all need to put me in a classroom. Y'all should have put me in a classroom. You should put me in a classroom. And, and so name yourself and claim your own voice while you're doing it. You don't have to sound like everybody else. Your name is not Al Sharpton. Your name is not Tariqa Mor Marley. Your name is who you are. And how if you whisper that is not right, God wants us to do better, is just as effective if you're screaming in a bullhorn. If you do something and never say a word to make things better, that's your voice. Claim it and don't let anybody take you off the mark of what that is and know your value more than you know your volume. All right? Your value more than your volume. Okay. Somewhere along the line, we learned or somebody taught us that for us to be effective as a people, we got to be loud and dancing all the time. Some of us ain't got rhythm. I'm not saying it. I don't know y'all. So, but some people don't have. But we don't have to be loud all the time. The biblical text says, "I look for God in the fire and the flood and the whirlwind." And where was God? In that still, small voice. I do believe actions speak louder than words. That you're doing something and not telling people that you're doing and don't look for a pat on the back is more about justice than anything you could possibly do. Do something kind, and you start small. If you're going to do social justice, you don't have to go, there, there was an old cartoon called Pinky and the Brain, and then they said, what are we gonna do today? We're gonna change the world. Well, that's, you can't do that. But you can change how you relate to the person sitting next to you, the person in your home. Stop telling your kids they're stupid and dumb and you can't wait for them to get up out the house. Stop telling your spouse, you chose that spouse. You prayed for that spouse, act like you prayed for that spouse. Oh, it was late when you did it, but I know you did it, all right? Thank you very much, all right. Let me go on because Dr. Parker said I had 30 minutes, so let me hurry up. An ism is an imbalance of power. It's an imbalance of power, and everything is connected to something else. So I'm going to run through about 15 different things that you will understand that it's about race and gender and sexuality and physicality and economics all together. If you work on one of those, you work on all of them. We cannot simply always, because we are black, work on race only because our lives are bigger than our melanin count. All right? And then I'll let you go to the rooms and. And I had 55 slides. That tells you how I overproduced. So call my house sometime and we'll talk about the 55 slides. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I've said that in Hebrews. All right. So um, let me do this real quick. When we talk about justice, I don't know if you can see this real clearly, but let me go through it. Understand that it's more than protest. It's social responsibility. It's our behavior with each other. It's what we do in the community and participate. It is advocacy. It is community organizing. It's charitable volunteerism. It's social entrepreneurship. It's protests and demonstrations. It's community building. It is philanthropy. It's community economic development. It is voting. 
All of those things go into change and transformation, and you can't do all of them, but somebody can do one of them, right? So when we talk about, yes, it's wonderful to go vote for an election, but what you doing the rest of the year? What are you doing on the local level? Are you teaching people what those referendums are for real, or you let them show up at the polls and they don't know what the, what the language is? So they just doing like you used to do on multiple choice tests when you were in school. Uh, I did three C's here, so let me do two D's over here. And stuff passes and you act like you don't know. So social justice is not when something happens, it's living and breathing a life about God, loving God, self, and neighbor, all right? It's not just knee-jerk. We do too much knee-jerk. We do too much knee-jerk. It is about redemption. It's about what God has already done, what God is doing, and what God will do in the world. It's about good news even in the wilderness. It is about person-centered affirmation, all right? People are not things. They are living and breathing. And when we used to talk about put yourself in somebody else's place, some of us are afraid to do that because we forgot that we used to be in that place. You know, some, no, y'all don't do that. When I was growing up, sometimes people would get healed or something or cured or something. Sometimes people had addictions and stuff like that and they put makeup on and came and you didn't know it. But you knew their history so you talked about them because you didn't believe people could change. Okay, let me go on, let me go on. All right, I'm gonna rush to, he told me not to go fast. All right, gentrification is in the biblical text. Ha, huh. redlining is in the biblical text. Where, Dr. Fry Brown? Well, I think there was somebody living in the promised land before the Israelites got there. It's in the book. Gentrification is a social justice thing. Somebody had to move out of the way for the chosen people to get in. It's in there. Affluenza and conspicuous consumption is a justice issue. I asked God when I was five, no, when I was 12, when I had those two pair of shoes, the Sunday shoes you had to put Vaseline on. Somebody come on with me now. There, there's my crew right there. There's my crew right there, right? And then a pair of kids, because we couldn't afford Converse, so we went to pay less and got the cheaper version, and we played like they were Converse, right? So I said to God, I said, God, when I grow up, let me have enough money to have as many shoes as I want. I will go without food if you let me have some shoes. And God was faithful. <laughs> but somebody's going without shoes. So I don't have to wait till somebody begs me to give an offering. Sometimes when I'm in the airport, I just have learned to just pull whatever I can out of my purse and give it to the person cleaning the toilet. Because I can afford to walk in the toilet and walk out, but they got to work 24-7. And do I tell everybody in the airport, I just gave that person $100? No, I do what God said and keep it moving because I am blessed beyond measure. I grew up in poverty and God has delivered me. Think about what we keep on buying and other people can't even get there. I, I think about this formula shortage and I saw people standing out in front of, of supermarkets where they went and bought all the formula they could and now they're selling it for a higher price. That's affluenza and conspicuous consumption. Gardner Taylor used to talk about when people have more on their body than they have in their mind. That's affluenza and conspicuous consumption, okay? Sex trafficking is in the biblical text. Prostitution is in the biblical text. Rape culture is in the biblical text. Look at the Old Testament. It's all up in there, right? Y'all gotta go check some of them words in the Old Testament because it's rape culture, okay? Um, homelessness, houselessness, I call it house, deficient housing instead of homelessness because persons who are living in boxes call that their home, their house. So ask them what's there. And now I can't read what's on the thing, but that's really okay. We're going to press on because y'all got to go to your rooms here. Um, linguistic othering, that's when you call somebody out their name. And please understand that we have used the word millennial wrong for the last 56 years. 
It's a generation like boomers and Xers and zennials. They're always going to be millennials. they grown people. They got jobs. They got bills. They got student loans. Stop treating them like they're five. When you say those people, that's verbal othering. Them over there, and we're not even going to get to the curse words we have for people. Okay? We have to be careful about calling people their physicality. We have to be careful about calling people unattractive. That's injustice. That's the power of the tongue. Bullying, cyberbullying, elder and child abuse. We talk a lot about child abuse, but elder abuse is also something we have to attend to. Elder abuse means that we make people over a certain age disposable. Now, I've been talking about this for 30 years, so it's not just because i got gray hair. I just have seen it, and I've seen it in churches. Okay? Uh, I, I've seen it when somebody is caring for a parent and they start calling the parent a child and I say, wait, 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 wait. That person has never been there before and neither have you. They are not a child. They're an adult that has some medical issues. So stop treating people over a certain age like they're disposable and don't mean anything. You're going to be lucky if you get there. Okay? Uh, sentencing guidelines... I know we talk about immigration, but we have to understand about reforms and restrictions and don't go with the first thing some politician is saying. Study what it means to not have a place to live that is safe. And when you want to go, I know we were brought by ships, but not everybody was. So think about that. It's amazing to me a group of people that for 400 plus years had been abused and talked against are now lining up with other folks talking about somebody that's a little lighter than them, that those people are taking our jobs. You don't want to clean the hotel room. You don't want to wash dishes, but they're taking our jobs and check the health care rules and check who's really paying taxes. Because some of y'all ain't filed for four or five years. All right, just war theory is something to look at too. With all these things that the Bible talks about wars and rumors of war, when is war justified? Remember, the people wanted Jesus to be a militant king because the Bible was replete with militant. We, we, what is it? Saul has kill, killed a thousand and David's killed 10,000. The Bible, the Old Testament, talks about just war because this is what you do because God told you to do it. And then we sit here and we stop examining why people are going to wear war. We stop examining how, if we know about Rahab and Sarah, we understand Jews and Muslims, because that's where that started, way back in the Bible. They've been fighting ever since. Okay? Some of y'all been fighting your families longer than that. All right, sentencing guidelines are important and drug stuff. And then it goes through medical testing and access. That's a social justice issue. Uh, ed extra, uh, let's see. Churches need to start talking about euthanasia. Churches need to talk about suicide and stop using Catholic doctrine for suicide. Just you got to look up what that's about. We pick things up from other faith systems and don't even examine what it is. We sit around talking about karma and then we talk about people that are Hindu. That word goes with Hindu, I'm just saying. All right? Think about that. Technology apartheid, voting rights, I have racial profiling down, and surrogacy. Surrogacy is in the biblical text. Go to the Old Testament if you don't believe me. And I think, I just really think, if I want to press my case before y'all go to your rooms, there was a certain amount of surrogacy going on with the birth of Jesus. Because that was God's only son impregnated in a human being. That's surrogacy. Uh, y'all got all quiet on that. I just took all the Jesus out of y'all, didn't I? Okay. Y'all gonna thank me later when Dr. Parker is up here preaching about that. Y'all gonna thank me later when you say, oh yeah, Dr. Fry Brown talked about that too, all right? And so we look at those kinds of things. So just think, so I just want us to know that when you're thinking about what's going on, the biblical text says there's nothing new under the sun. What happened is we got names for it. Everything that we're doing, you find someplace in the biblical text and you don't have to eisegete to find it. And even technology, because one time the wheel was technology. Okay? All right. Now that I just blew you out of the water with surrogacy, I will let you go to your rooms for what you have to do now. I don't know who does that now.
Lord be praised. Thank God for Dr. Fry Brown. Can you help me thank God for her? She fell like we're back in seminary. Yes, 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 yes. Real quickly, real quickly, um, we need to move um, expeditiously. I'm almost um, tempted to stay right here, but I want to get in trouble, but with Pastor, so we're going to go to our breakout rooms uh, for the time that we have. We are um, going to ask those persons who are in uh, breakout room number one, you may remain here in the sanctuary. If you are in breakout room number two, Dr. Matthew Plack, can you please stand? You're going to go in the chapel, in the chapel. If you are in breakout room number three, Dr. Pearl Smith, can you stand please and wave your hand again? You're going to follow her to the uh, left fellowship hall. When you get to the fork in the road, go to the room that's on the left. That's fellowship room number three. And if you have breakout room number four, Reverend Kevin Jackson, wave your hand again. You're going to go to breakout room number four, which is basically the right side of the fellowship hall. Our online guests, I failed to mention in the beginning, you're going to hang out with us here in the sanctuary, and you can put your questions. If you're on Box Chat, Facebook, YouTube, you can um, ask your questions, you can chat your questions, and we'll be able to collect your questions there. So you will hang out with us here in the sanctuary. We'll see you all again at 8.10. check one two good evening folks and I, I, I don't want to inconvenience you but we're, we're gonna be over here if you can get over here. if you can't stay where you are and we'll go and we'll go ahead and get started we have very 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 limited time and so um, we're gonna jump right into this so our assignment tonight is to take what dr. Fry Brown uh, offered on tonight and what we're supposed to do is to examine it uh, a little bit more deeply and come up with a couple of questions that we can pose to her a little bit later. So one of the things that jumped out at me right away at the very beginning, oh, you know what I need? Can I get somebody who's, who has amazing penmanship? A good writer. Who's a good writer? Anybody. Can you, can you take some notes for me up here? That would be great. That would be great. And that way, we will, I'm going to push that back a little bit. And so just follow my cue. So she started out with this whole idea of justice, talking about social justice. And the one thing I could not get away from that jumped out at me, and I want you to to help me out with this. She talked about the fact that in order to make change, you need faith. She said you need faith in order to make change. What I've discovered though is there has to be something else that goes along with our faith to help us implement change. So my question to you tonight is what would you pair with faith in order to have what you need to make change? I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. So I work, I was a former school teacher for 11 years, an English language arts teacher. And my school is, was deep in the hood. My high school was deep, like deep in the hood. And so students brought knives and guns and nunchucks and all kinds of craziness to school. And so I grew up in Liberty City in Miami, Florida. So I was familiar with the culture. So I didn't, you know, I didn't fear coming to work. 
but there were some teachers who feared coming to work. We knew that there had to be some, soci some societal change within the bounds of the schools, the school that we, uh, we were working at. Well, one person took a very bold initiative and, <laughs> and she fought students. She literally, literally physically fought students, would, would, would pull them out of fights and would, would, would uh, go, go find them wherever they were in the building and pull them into study sessions and so on and so forth. And so she had this belief system that the only way to get them to do what they needed to do was to go and get them. There was this physical approach. But she also needed faith. She also needed to believe that her way was the right way. In this particular instance, Dr. Fry Brown talks about faith in order to make change. What else, what other tangible kind of attribute will you put with your faith to make real change? I'm thinking about one word in particular. What would you put with your faith? I can believe it all I want to, but there's something else that has to go with it. What else? I see a hand. Yes. Boldness. Give me, give me, give me, give me some other synonyms for boldness. Yeah. Confident. Courage. Boldness. Thanks, you, thank you, sis. Confidence. Boldness. Courage. So think of a question you would ask Dr. Fry Brown as it pertains to faith and boldness or courage as it applies to making change. What would be a good question? What would be a good question? Oh. Uh, what would be a good question you would ask her to help better understand, help you better understand how, how you could make change Using faith and what? Boldness, courage, and confidence. Give me a complete sentence uh, in the form of a question that you would ask her. And, and, our, and our scribe is going to write that question down. You could say something. Yes. In order to obtain this boldness, this confidence, this um, courageousness to move forward, to step out. Because for me, I think if I was in that situation, I think a lot of things that would hold me back is this, I'm frozen in fear. It's easy to say, wow. have this confidence and this boldness and all of these good things and, your, and step out in your faith. How but can I overcome my fear to yes, make change? Yes, that's it, simple. <laughs> Thank you so much. How can I overcome my fear um, what I want to, we have another one? Yes, yes, yes. What else would it take to make this happen? Yes, mm -hmm. I have faith, I believe, but what else does it take? Do I have to organize a team of people? Do I need to go before, you know, legislation? What else does it take? Um, and, 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 and for the purposes of this discussion, take what, what my sister just said and come up, with a, come up with a word that would encapsulate everything that she just said. What would we need in addition to our faith, in addition to boldness, to make change? Oh my gosh, you just said a mouthful of this is wisdom. Faith without wis wisdom, without, or, or faith without wisdom, knowing how to apply your faith. Knowing that you can't run, you can't always run into a burning building. That's wisdom to deal with whatever the issue is. And so we also, how can I overcome uh, my fear? Uh, uh, though I guess the other thing would be we can use wisdom or we can apply, or, or better yet, how do we apply wisdom and faith at the same time? How do we apply wisdom and faith at the same time? We want to get one more question out of this. Um, something Dr. Fry Brown said I thought was intriguing, and she said this. She said, if you say it, if you said it, you meant it. If you said it, you meant it. Yes. Hi. I heard Dr. Fry Brown talking about um, if you have 
So in, in the clip, Harriet went on in the water, right, while the others did not. And she said, well, maybe that was Harriet's um, calling, right? That was for her to do that and others were to do other things. And I believe that it's true. I understand that. But I also believe that um, you have to galvanize a bit. You have to have some groups. You, you have to lead some people to be able to enact this change, right? So I guess my question is, how do we, what are the steps to use your faith, use your wisdom to galvanize others to move along or, or to push this agenda? How can you galvanize others to make change? Reverend Fishburne, um, someone in the chat said you need purpose. 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 You have to figure out what it is God has called you to do. Uh, Dr. Fry Brown talked about the fact that everybody... Uh, uh, if we would really look into it really, really carefully, every, how, do we galvan, how do you galvanize people to make change or others to make change? You're the one that's fine. Everybody's not called to the same mission. Everybody's not called to the same goal. You want to know what? When a fourth grade student tripped me at school and I tore my rotate, rotator cuff, I had a come to Jesus moment with God. It's like, God, this education thing probably is not, it's probably not what you called me to do. And that, among other things, compelled me to move on, to do something different. We have to figure out what it is God has called us to do. What is that thing? Uh, I've, I often hear people say this. I've, I heard a preacher say this once. That was so, it blessed me so much. Sometimes um, our, our testimony can be found in our test. The thing that we keep going through, that we're trying to break through and push through, oftentimes the thing that God has called us to do sometimes can be, can be found embedded in the trials that we face repeatedly. Uh, I was a drug and alcohol counselor for 18 years. I had others, uh, uh, clients who would go through our program and they would come out and guess what? They would become a drug and alcohol counselor. It was their, eight, it was their, their time it, it, using drugs and alcohol that compelled them to come out of that and to want to go back and help others. So I want to think about another question. And, and, and Dr. Fry Brown, yes. In the back. Um, so I have someone in the chat that said, what makes you believe it will work? That well, was her question. And I think that that is where the faith comes in. That is where the faith comes in. That's the faith question. Um, <laughs> you know, is this what God called me to do? Knowing before you set out to do that thing, is this what God called me? I know without a shadow of a doubt, without the slightest fear of contradiction, that this thing is what God called me to do. The other part of that, too, is that sometimes you need to stick your toe in other uh, pools of water to figure out what it is you're supposed to be doing. Um, if you're about 75 pounds and slender and, and frame, you probably shouldn't try out for the football team. That may not be your call. And so you try to figure out what it is God has called you to do. And more often than not, our calls are often connected to what our giftings are. That thing that we're good at doing and that we enjoy doing. Um, as we prepare to, to transition in a bit, Dr. Fry Brown talked about this whole idea of if you say it, you meant it. And I want to build on that a little bit. Uh, a little bit. This, this whole idea of speaking, of speaking uh, uh, truth to power. And what is now beginning to happen in uh, popular society, you see it on social media, is nobody is accountable for what they say. People just say whatever they want to say, whatever they're big and bad and bold enough to say. Uh, and Mike Tyson says something I thought was so profound. He said that social media has emboldened and made people bold when they know that they're not going to get punched in the face for saying crazy stuff. And so this whole idea of saying stuff, saying what we mean, means in part that we have to deliberate about what we say. That we can't just, whatever comes up can't just come out. That it is not your thing and you can do what it, with it what you please. That whatever comes up and comes out may not necessarily be the right thing. What you say, you meant. Um, Betty Joyce Fishburne, my mama, uh, when you would run your mouth a little bit too much 
and you got a little bit of that backhand, I know y'all didn't grow up in that kind of household. I, I understand. It was because I said something and she sensed that I was being mannish and I meant it. And I suffered a consequence. So let's come up with a question to deal with those who consistently say what they mean and then act it out. We now know that the Uvalde shooter actually had a semi-manifesto. He had written some things down on the internet, on his Facebook page. We knew it was coming, and when I say we, I mean the, 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 uh, the, the powers that be knew something was coming. He told us. Uh, you remember Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber? He had a, an almost 100 plus page manifesto telling us exactly what his feelings were about government, about government buildings and authority. And what did he do? He parked a U-Haul truck in front of, the, uh, in, in, in front of the, the building in Oklahoma City and killed many people, including children. What is the question we want to ask as it pertains to what we say and the, the power and the influence related to what we say, our words. Uh, Dr. Fry Brown, by the way, when she was last here at, at, uh, at Zion Hill, preached a sermon entitled, Use Your Words. Use Your Words. She preached a sermon entitled, Use Your Words. So what would be something we could ask that addresses this whole issue? Dr. Uh, Reverend Fishburne, someone yes. in the chat said, it takes action. Take action. Who said that? A member of the chat. Oh, a member in the chat. Take action. I see we're, we're running out of time and people are coming back in. Uh, this will be sufficient, I guess. We're going to go with our three questions and we'll get together again tomorrow night with our, with our second speaker on tomorrow night. So thank you all very much. Uh, and we are transitioning back into our, into, our, uh, into our main group. Thank you so much.
Amen. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm sure you had a, a short time to uh, unpack Dr. Fly Brown's uh, commentary and her sharing and her offering. Uh, but we do have a couple of questions that we want to uh, uh, put to her and uh, so we can continue to our rich vocabulary and our rich exchange. So we're going to uh, ask our facilitators to come up one by one and they're going to share uh, some of the questions uh, that you brought forward to them. We're going to start with Elder Fishburn and uh, then um, uh, Dr. Platt will come with his question and then Dr. Pearl will come with her question and then Reverend Kevin Jackson will come with his. And if we have time, we'll do another round again. While I'm up here, um, after we get done with our Q&A, uh, uh, Deacon Williams will close us out in prayer. But you are to pick up your children. Uh, if you have children, <laughs> while I'm up here, <laughs> I'm trying to get out the way. Uh, of course, your babies, three months to three years of age, are in the nursery. Uh, four to 12, they will be in their classroom. So when you drop them off at, you will pick them up from there. And your teenagers, uh, 13 to 18, they will be hanging out in the gymnasium, gymnasium. So when we get done here, you can directly go and grab your, uh, your young children, and we will see you again on tomorrow. So um, let me get out the way. The order fish Dr. Brown, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned you need faith to make change. How does one overcome their fear in an effort to cause change? Uh, there's something called metamorphic boldness, which means that we all know that we're limited in some way to make change. Fannie Lou Hamer once said, I don't know anymore when I leave the house if I'll return, but if I fall, we'll be five feet, four inches closer to the cause of freedom. I don't think there's any way to be to say what fear is and what faith is. I know we do those kind of, those cute little cliche-ish kind of sermons, but much of what happens in social transformation is the urging and pushing of God into a situation that we didn't think we were equipped for. And it's doing it the way that only we can. It, it's, it's realizing why David wouldn't wear Saul's armor. So for each person in here, your meeting of your fearfulness is between you and God. So I can't give you a real pat answer. I know that there are times that I walk into situations where I'm the only one that looks like me and my blood pressure goes up and my heart is beating heavy and all I do is think about the people that could never be invited in the room, period. Amen. And that makes me go forward. And my voice for the first couple of times drops an octave and it's shaky. But once I feel my help come, that's a little preacherish kind of situation, then I can stand with anybody. Now, when I get to my car, I may fall apart. But for that moment, there's some kind of adrenaline flowing that says I can do that. And if we, because in this country we make everyone who does something in social justice a hero or a heroine and forget that they're human beings, we never ask where they're afraid. Nobody asks all those people that wound up in parchment prison if they were afraid. We just went on the smooth side because that's how we do in media. Everybody recovers, nobody's afraid, everybody's a superhero, but in our humanness, and we understand we can't do anything without God, we're going to be scared. If we're not scared, you need more than the one therapist I have. Okay. You need, you need some help. There has, to be, there has to be that. Because change hurts. Change costs. Change is uncomfortable. We will talk about prune me God all day long and if God gives us one little bump, we want to go away. But change is about pruning away what is not of God and it's painful. And I think that you should have a little bit of fear before you go into doing anything. Good evening. Our, our group had a related question in that that you know, as black people, given that we live in the reality of America and we have seen what has happened historically and the patterns that still continue today, how do we deal with this idea of fatigue that you brought up and deal with some resentments that have built up over time to allow ourselves to give people the space to be capable of change? So kind of it's, it's how do we start, given our history and culture and context, mm -hmm. to take the kind of social justice change that, that, that you've laid out? 
How does one start? Uh, the easy way would see one step at a time. When I was a speech language pathologist, I taught people how to speak again with small step programming. And that means that we get, a, we get away from the idea that one time engagement is going to make everything okay. In my, in my studies and my work in social transformation, laws don't change people. Every time we have a law, there's going to be some backlash. When we have an election, there's going to be a backlash. Transformation happens at a human, one at a time level. And you do something and you join with somebody else. But we've got it really mixed up that if we just have one law, everything's going to be okay. And, and throughout the history of this country, it's made it worse. And because media is so prevalent now, sometimes we get the idea that what we see on the media that leads and bleeds thing is everywhere. It's like somebody saying, the black church does. And I say, have you been to every black church? Black people do. Have you talked to every black person? White people, have you talked to everyone? And so, yes, it seems like it keeps scaffolding and it's more and more and more and more. It's different, but it's more and more and more and more, which is why I talk about justice fatigue, which means you do as much as you can do and then stop. Take a sabbatical and let somebody else step in and let them work. Stop. Let somebody else do it. Everybody can't be on the front lines. What I learned when I was in college is I could not be the person standing there at the front line. They told my, my, my colleagues said, somebody has to graduate. You go back because you write and you write the things and collect the money to get us out of jail. We're going to stand on the front line. What we've gotten to now is everybody's on the front line and nobody's doing the groundwork. Nobody's doing the small step stuff. Nobody's negotiating because we want to be on television being seen as the one that's doing the justice thing. Um, uniting uh, allyship is critically important. I work with women in ministry and I tell them there are men who lost pastors for helping us get in place. So you can't say all men do. In like manner, there are people who don't look like us who actually would help us without compromising us. But we need to find out who those people are and not trust everybody. And it's not about political parties, it's about persons within political parties. I have colleagues who are Republicans, but there's many different kinds of Republicans as there are different kinds of Democrats. So we can have conversations about some of the equals. So I can't assume everybody is against me because that also is very painful. If we think that all these groups are against us, there, may, there are some people who are against us, but that doesn't mean it's everybody. So I don't know, I, I couldn't hear real clear through your mask, so you need to help me if I got close to what you asked me, because that's just where I was. Is that, was, that, was I close? Thank you so much. Thank you for having mercy upon me. Right there, letting me think. That's it? That's all the questions? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Pastor Parker said, no, stay. Good evening, Dr. Brown. My group wants to know, how do we eradicate cubbyhole mentality? Ah. So if, if, I, if, if this, I think this is what you're talking about. It's kind of like cliques and clubs and stuff, right? We all wear t-shirts the same color, like we're a family reunion all the time, and we hate our family. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 oh. <laughs> late in the evening, it's late in the evening, or my denomination. The, the, the mentality of, that is ingrained in the fiber of this country, you have to remember the people that came in the Mayflower, people got kicked out of their own country because they owed stuff. And so we set up this, my group is better, and it keeps building and building. We are kindergartners that have little groups and stuff. And we dress people that way. We have to go back to the root of what does it mean to be, remember I said relationality. What does it mean to be in relationship and what does it mean to accept people who are different than us in any manner? Whether it's skin color or height or physicality or something, but that prevailing template 
in America is there's one way to look that's acceptable. There's one way to talk that's acceptable. There's one way to dance that's acceptable. There's one way to love that's acceptable. There's one, and we put all of these standards in and we fall right into it. Instead of saying, I, I'm, no, I'm not, that's not me. So again, I know you're gonna get tired of me saying that. Individuals didn't do that. We can't have a mandate to say from now on we won't have matching t-shirts. From now on, we're going to get rid of denominations. Denominations mean less than the name anyhow. So we're doing ourselves a disservice when we're jumping into these different little clubs because nomina means name. D is less than. So we have segmented God to protect power. Power. Remember I said all the isms are about power. That's exactly what it is. Ageism. I don't know if I had that on there. Ageism is real, not just for children and youth, but for elders. Ageism. Instead of, we came from a culture where we had multiple generations in a household. I mean, I know that's old timey for some of y'all, but because of the housing prices, y'all getting ready to have multiple generations in households again. And so we're going to have to learn how to break down barriers even in our families so we don't have the cubbyhole mentality. And I think that there was also, um, not just in my lifetime, but if we look social historically in our communities, we didn't label people uh, negatively for how they looked or who they loved or their talents. It's when we try to acclimate fully into a society that was already split and divided that we picked up those habits. Someplace there was a thing that if you lay down with dogs, you get up with fleas. And some of us are full of fleas now because we forgot that we came from a, a culture that was about uni uniting across differences. But it was easier to be accepted. Two things that my research with Dr. Harding taught me. The Great Migration, when we were moving out of, people were moving out of enslavement, and then in order to be accepted, they thought if they talked like and dressed like the people that had power, they would be better accepted. And then when we finished in the 50s, people began to think it was finished as soon as we got to ride a bus. And it wasn't. And so people are surprised, but it was all about striving to rise socially and economically, and we forgot the humanity as we were doing that. And then we became ashamed of people in our own families who we used to allow into the cookout. And I'm not just talking about the folks with guns. I mean, I grew up around guns, right? Uh, in fact, they wouldn't let me shoot one because I always made noise when it went off. And um, happens when I go to gun range now too. Um, but there was something about protecting each other that we have lost. And it's not just about those young people don't listen because we're the parents of the young people that don't listen. So who did we not listen to that we raise young people that don't listen to us? Cubbyhole mentality. Okay. And churches at one point in time, um, and maybe it was, and this is an argument that's made sometimes in, in black church studies, it's when we couldn't go anyplace else, we were together. But when we could go past the line that said the black people live south of the railroad track, then we forgot that we belonged to each other. And then we started competing in a game that was set up for us not to win. And while we were doing that, we were, you, we were losing both faith and humanity. And churches who used to worship together became competitors. I'm back to reality show TV. Everything is set up on a competition basis. All right, you can dance better than who can dance, who can jump. There's some inane thing where they're swinging on ropes and stuff, and that's a competition. It takes no kind of skill to do that. It used to be playground stuff, right? But we're set up on that, and we feed off of that. And as we're feeding off of that, we become more and more self-centered instead of community-centered. So social justice doesn't take place because somebody's going to sell you out before you get things changed. Right? You used to know in your community who was the one that could be bought. And now you don't because everybody wants a paycheck. Okay, I'm done with that question. I've been teaching this stuff for about 40 years. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Wow. 
<clears throat> thank you so much for this evening. And so the first question I wanted to, to, to bring up the group four had was, if you had a particular pedagogy to develop self-love, since you talked a lot about mm. transformation happening at the individual level, you talked mm -hmm. about a lot of the, the glue about, uh, in terms of what you discussed, and how do you, how do you develop this pedagogy of self-love? Okay. Um, because I've been teaching adults for the last 48 years, uh, in the biblical text, there's a question that God asked Adam and Eve in the garden when they were clothed with fig leaves, is who told you you were naked? And so I start by saying, who told you you were worthless? Who told you you were ugly? Who told you you couldn't do that? Did God tell you that? Who gave those people power to tell you that you were worthless and would never succeed? Who told them that they could beat on you like you were a punching bag? Who did that? So when I talked about this, this punching bag, I mean, this holding the mirror up to ourselves, the interrogation of self is where one has to start. When did we give our power over to somebody else? How do we come in and talk about a loving God, an affirming God? We can do all things through Christ that gives us strength, and then we go home or we go to work and we act like God is dead. How did we get to that point? So pedagogically, I think I, I try to help people. I don't tell them what to do. I ask a series of questions. It's an Aristotelian or whatever, but we do a series of questions, and I have to accept whatever answer they give me back. But I want people to think. Because I think too often what we do in teaching, whether it's church or the academy, is we spoon feed people and we don't ask them questions that they can muse and wrestle with it themselves. And that's part of what that is. It's too good. We, we've, we've begun to rely on self-help books by people that are neither self or help. And we just want to give them money. They wrote it last night because they knew it would, if they put the right little clicks in it. You know how sometimes... Uh, you have a pastor who is an excellent homiletician, but sometimes you can listen to a sermon and you know they are nothing in the sermon and all they do is give 55 cliches and you up shouting. <laughs> oh, that was really good. And then five minutes later, I said, what did they say? You said, I don't know, but it felt good. <laughs> Those are like cotton candy sermons. And so it's, it's, it's having us look at ourselves deeply and try to find out where along the way did I decide to co-op myself so that somebody else could be important? And, it, and it's that kind of thing. And so we have these discussions, and it's a lot of listening, and it's a lot of letting people be angry. And, and it is also for, uh, this is done in very many different ways, instead of me saying that I healed you, it's giving you tools to heal yourself. That's the pedagogy. That's, I think that's the best way to do it. Because if I heal you, you owe me. So we get back to what you said. If I heal you, you owe me. But if I give you a tool and you do the own work, you don't owe anybody but yourself for that. In like manner, you can't come back to next week and say, Dr. T, what you told me to do didn't work. Because we've also gotten to a point in this country where... I'm sorry doesn't mean anything, and tantruming is par for the course. We have a nation full of tantrumers, and there are no consequences for the tantrum. Y'all raise children. I know, they said you're not supposed to put them in time out. Ah, you better find some corners and put some people's faces in them and let them stand there and let them work out their own soul salvation. Right? But we have a tantrumers, and so I have adults that come in. They want an A. Did you do the work? It's racism. Did you do the work? I don't want to be here. Go home. <laughs> right? I did this. And I said, I get a check whether you show up or not, but you paid for this, so you made a choice to do this. You made a choice to come to a particular church. You made a choice to work a particular job. So don't tantrum in my face because you made that choice. I didn't drag you to it. Nowhere in the biblical text did Jesus drag anybody to temple. No place. Jesus always asked, do you want to be made well? Now, Jesus knew, but Jesus asked, do you want? So when, when people come and they want to work through those kinds of, do you want to, do you want to get better? 
I can't make you better. Do you want to get better? I can send you to somebody that can walk you through it, but I'm not going to take it on that I'm that because too many of us shoulder the responsibility for healing the land, and that's not our job. That was not on our birth certificate. You may have had a vision, but you're probably looking at the wrong thing. God's the only one that can do that. Yeah. I'm done? I'm done. <laughs> Technically, uh, she was not done. We have about three more questions virtually, but she's done for tonight. She's going to definitely have to come back and share with us. Um, in the interest of time, uh, beloved, we are definitely want to um, 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 honor our time that we have, and we want to make sure that you get sent out in good fashion so you can come back refreshed and restored tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Fry Brown, I've uh, been a um, uh, theological fan of hers from afar for a couple of years, and so she's just really it's very hard to unpack almost five decades of what she has. So she just gave us something wonderful, a uh, wonderful gift. And I want to encourage you, the best way to honor her, which she shared with us tonight, is to have further discussions uh, with each other uh, to co continue to unpack what she shared with us tonight. Um, those of you who are online and you had questions, we definitely recognize you. We couldn't get to you tonight, but you will have first dibs tomorrow when we come back to our whole group session, you will be first. Boxcast, Facebook, uh, YouTube, we couldn't get to all the questions tonight, but you will have first dibs. I um, hope you're saying amen. If you are, just chat and say amen. That's, that's cool. You're good with that. All right. <laughs> all right, so uh, Pastor Parker, you want to share anything? Yes, yes, yes. And then uh, Deacon uh, Williams, you will come and close us out in prayer. Brothers and sisters, have we not been blessed on this evening? And because we want everyone to come back on tomorrow evening, I am not going to prolong this time. But let us hear what the woman of God has said to us on this evening about how we really make change. Not just how we show up in front of the television or make a name for ourselves, but how change, positive, wholesome, just change happens. It starts with you. It starts with me. We have to treat each other justly. That's how it starts. God bless you and God keep you. Dick Williams, why don't you come? Good evening, good evening, good evening. As we prepare to, uh, as we prepare to leave this evening, uh, we want to thank God for an opportunity to come and fellowship and to come to hear a word from a woman of God that Faith and social justice are uh, a phrase that one so deep and so wide and so high. God had blessed her that she might come and bless us on this evening. And we thank you, God, for this opportunity. We're praying for each and every one that is here and that you grab a hold to this faith and social justice. And, and, and may you bless us to be, with the strength and the wherewithal as we leave this place to continue to remain understanding faith and social justice as it truly and really is. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Zion Hill Baptist Church, our pastor, our first lady, our congregation, we give you thanks and we give you all praise. Amen. <laughs>